You listen to the third hour of the Live with Rank show, and for that, I thank you. Online with me, as I uh, stated, is former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representative Newt Gingrich. And for those of you who may not, uh, the younger, I have a lot of younger listeners. He's a politician, historian, author, political consultant. He represented Georgia's 6th Congressional District as a Republican from 1979 through 1999, served as the 58th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives from 95 to 99. He was a co-author, if you've heard of that, with the architect of the, and architect, I should say, of the contract with America. And uh, Newt Gingrich was a major leader in the Republican victory in 1994 congressional elections. And in fact, in 1995, Newt was named a man of the year for his role in ending the four years, decades long Democratic majority in the House. He helped pass welfare reform, passed the capital gains tax cut, and passed the first balanced budget since 1969. Uh, welcome to the Live with Rank show, uh, Newt Gingrich. Well, Rank, it's great to be with you and have a chance to talk about ideas. And uh, we certainly are in a situation uh, both in the country and in Washington where we could use a new generation of ideas. So I appreciate you putting all this in context. Uh, definitely, and that's what this is all about, my show, is putting the ideas out there and let the people decide. You wrote an article, New, called Obama's Crackdown on the For-Profit Colleges Will Reduce Educational Opportunities, and specifically you were looking at the gainful employment regulation. Why don't you explain to my listeners what the gainful employment regulation is. Regulation, it's kind of, I don't even know how they came up with that name for that regulation, once you know what it is. And well, your it, thoughts it's... On that. Look, it's an 842-page proposed regulation from Washington, D.C., from the Obama Department of Education. It is uh, designed to make it very, very hard for any kind of for-profit school to provide services, particularly to poor people. It would affect hundreds of thousands of single mothers, hundreds of thousands of uh, Latinos and African Americans, uh, and it's designed... Uh, I think basically to drive um, people who are in the free enterprise, small business, education business out of business. Uh, it applies only to people who are uh, small businesses or, or, or for-profit businesses. does not apply to uh, government-run schools, which may actually have worse records. So it's a fascinating case study. People who want to learn more about it can go to www opportunitydenied.org, and they'll see the whole story right there. But uh, I am amazed that the government has taken this position uh, and is trying to pass it. And I wrote the article to alert people that they should call their, their senators and their congressmen and urge them to speak out against this kind of 840-page Washington-based regulation. Right. You wrote, Newt, that the gainful employment regulation, that the Department of Education would basically disqualify any program uh, offered for by a for-profit college from accepting student loans if its graduates, on average, have monthly student loan payments in excess of 8 percent. Currently, it's around 12, 13 percent for both public and private, correct? That's right. And I, there's a secondary part of this, which is this would require the school to keep records of how much you're earning. So think about the intrusion into your personal life. Uh, and would, they'd have to do so for a number of years. So the, the extra administrative cost, the extra burden of paperwork, and the fact that you now have your school telling you, if you come to my school, I'm going to track your income for the next five or six or seven years, uh, that's a very chilling effect on people. Uh, and is, is just one more example of how biased this particular proposed regulation is. Well, what do they mean, or what do you mean when you said the Department of Education would disqualify any program? Are you saying that they would not, at some point, they would say that that college, well, go ahead. No, what they would say is you're not allowed to get a student loan to go to that school. That's what I thought. So, so they are, in effect, uh, saying that they in Washington are now going to decide what your range of choices should be. That's why we use OpportunityDenied.org as our website, because... They're going to deny you the opportunity, but let's say you're you're a working mother, and you have a job, and you can't you have to take care of your family. You can't afford to stop everything to go back to school for two years. But if you could find a, a place that was offering you part-time learning, 
Uh, you might be able to learn at night. You might be able to learn on the weekends. Uh, we have a very famous person here in Washington, Arthur Brooks, who is the head of the American Enterprise Institute, has a Ph.D. He was a professional French horn player and decided he wanted to go back uh, and get a college degree, and he couldn't just take time off. He had several children. He had to work. Uh, but he was able to find an institution that enabled him at his convenience on his schedule to learn. He ultimately got a college degree, and then he was able to get a scholarship and ultimately got a Ph.D., he, he he says none of that would have been possible if if this bill had blocked him from being able to go to that school. And to your point, they're not holding up public schools, in this case colleges and universities, to the same standards. How how do they thread that needle? Well, they don't. They don't even try to. They just they just say we're the Department of Education, we're the bureaucrats in Washington. We control all this, and this is how we wanted to write it. And they know. If they extended exactly the same test to every single school in the country, that the number of government-run schools that would fail the test is dramatically bigger than the number of for-profit schools that would fail the test. So it's clearly designed as an anti-free enterprise, anti-small business, uh, anti-opportunity if you want to choose the school you want to go to. Uh, is not designed uh, as an across-the-board equal test of every school, uh, and therefore it's inherently anti-free enterprise and in favor of big government bureaucracies. Online with me is former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives Newt Gingrich talking about this gainful employment regulation in regards to colleges. And just to make it clear, what we're talking about is if a for-profit college, which would then have to track how much money you make for how many years after you graduate, if your debt to earnings ratio is 8% or above 8%, then the Department of Education would disqualify your school you got that degree from from receiving any student loans. Yet your debt to ratio, debt to earnings ratio could be 15% for public and nothing would happen. Correct, Newt? That's right. And so you actually have a situation where, sadly, a number of people end up going to very, very weak uh, government-run schools uh, borrow the money, uh, not do very well, end up not getting a very good job, uh, would have had a chance to go to maybe a more effective school and a school that offered them more choices on their own terms. Uh, and we need to recognize that there's, a, there's really a dramatic period of innovation underway now, and people are out here uh, doing remarkable things, and we should, we should not back off from the idea that we're committed to every American having a chance to get the best possible education at the lowest possible cost. And do, I, I liken it to what's happening here also from the K through 12. The super, state superintendent, Mike Flanagan, is attacking charter schools, trying to hold them to different standards than they do the public K through 12. Same thing it sounds like here. You're trying to hold the for-profit colleges, and that would be like Hillsdale uh, College here, uh, not far from my uh, flagship station. And others from uh, you're holding them to a different standard than you are the rest of the country. I mean, the rest of the the public schools. Where can they go to get more information on that, Newt? If, if they'll go to www.opportunitydenied.org, uh, they'll find it right there. And uh, real quickly, while we have a few more minutes with you, you being a history teacher and written extensively about history, I wanted to ask your thoughts about likening the situations that's happening right now with Putin and in the Ukraine to back when, for instance, Germany annexed Austria in March of 1938. Germany annexed the uh, Sudanland region of Czechoslovakia in October of 1988. Germany took the rest of Czechoslovakia in March of 1939. Would you agree with the historical parallels being drawn between Russia's annexation of Crimea and its actions down in eastern Ukraine with the German annexation of Austria and Czechoslovakia? Well, that's, that's a parallel. Uh, I don't think that Putin is a, a Hitlerian figure, but I do think that aggressive authoritarian leaders fill the vacuum that weak leaders create. And I think a lot of these folks are, are, are taking a look at uh, President Obama and concluding that he's just not a very strong person, and so they see an opportunity for them to fill in the vacuum that he is creating. 
Uh, and the result is that uh, I think we have a real challenge here, and we have to recognize how real that challenge is. Well, what do you think Vladimir Putin's goal is then when he's taking Crimea and eastern Ukraine? Is it to break well, I, NATO? I think he's ve- look, I think he's very much like Bismarck when Bismarck was in the process of, or, of, of bringing together the German Empire. Uh, Putin has said publicly he, he regards the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, he is deeply determined to rebuild the Russian Empire. He even describes parts of eastern Ukraine in language that goes back to the czars in the 18th century. Uh, I mean, you know, language we have not heard in the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, so it's, it's pretty clear he has an idea of what he wants to accomplish. Uh, the danger is that President Obama is so weak and so confused, and there are now so many different problems worldwide. As you know, yesterday we had the the uh, North Koreans released an interview tape with uh, the three Americans held prisoner in North Korea. You have the problem of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. You have uh, the collapse of Libya. I mean, every time you turn around on, on Obama's watch, it's a little bit like watching a fire department with the whole city burning. Uh, and then he goes on TV and announces we have no strategy. I, I didn't find that very reassuring. Well, as I said, if you if you really didn't have one, don't say, tell everybody that. Yeah, uh, that's you, right. Don't hold the press conference. I mean, right, right. Now, call do a you, meeting. Call a meeting to develop a strategy. Do you believe, though, with Russia and Putin, that if he, let let Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, could they be next? And will NATO well, actually they, they, do anything? They could be next, and I think that uh, uh, NATO is in the process of putting uh, NATO forces in all three countries. I think we're in the process of reinforcing Poland. Uh, I believe we should be uh, helping the Ukrainian government with uh, equipment and training and, and intelligence information. Now, the Ukrainians actually were doing pretty well, and I think that... Uh, We want to make Putin understand that there are going to be very severe costs, uh, not just economic sanctions and things like that. But uh, it's conceivable that a Ukrainian military that was uh, equipped and trained uh, by the Americans and had American intelligence, no American forces, but but solid equipment, solid training and solid intelligence, could actually defeat uh, the uh, Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. And uh, I think that may be... Uh, very important in raising the cost to Putin and getting him to understand that there are limits to his kind of bullying and his kind of aggrandizement. We only a couple minutes left. I want to ask you one quick question, then I want to circle back to the gainful employment. Since 9-11, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld and his successors have advocated for smaller, more flexible, uh, more agile military to deal with this new kind of enemy, I guess, uh, the terrorist organizations, rather than nations with standing armies. Do we need to reassess our ability, uh, reassess that and our ability to protect Western Europe? You you have to do both. You have to have a military, for example, if you wanted to intervene with uh, in Ukraine, if you want to intervene in in Pakistan, if uh, the North Koreans go crazy and and, uh, come across the border in South Korea, you have to have a regular force capable of getting the job done. At the same time, you have to have a lot of uh, intelligence and a lot of special forces. And you need to recognize that we're not fighting ISIS. ISIS is just a symptom. Uh, radical Islamic terrorism is, is a virus. It is like Ebola. Uh, we need to think of it as an epidemiology problem. There are over 10,000 terrorists from over 50 countries now working with ISIS in Syria and and Iraq. This is not a, do you solve Iraq or do you solve Syria? This is a worldwide virus for over 100 Americans. Uh, We had uh, somebody from uh, Minneapolis killed the other day. There are over 500 British terrorists operating with ISIS. And we need to think of this as a worldwide virus, not as a, just as a single geographic problem. And we're going to have to develop a, uh, a strategy that, that gets rid of them. What, what would that strategy look like if you were president? Well, the British, the British are taking first steps. Uh, the prime minister has announced, for example, that if you go to Syria, you're going to lose your passport and not be allowed back in. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to make it illegal to be in favor of ISIS, to, talk, to, to recruit for ISIS, to advocate for ISIS. I mean, they're, they're taking very serious steps to confront the fact that Britain itself at home has a serious terrorism problem. And do you like those ideas, Newt? Absolutely. I think, s- I think you're facing a movement which wants to kill you and kill your civilization. And uh, the longer we deny that reality, the more trouble we're going to be in. 
I'm speaking with former Speaker of the U.S. House of Representative Newt Gingrich. Well, let's circle back and just have a little bit of time here. Again, you came on originally to speak about this gainful employment, actually, yeah, gainful employment regulation, and it's basically an attack on non uh, for profit colleges where they're not holding up for profit colleges to they being the government to the same standards or public colleges to the same standards as for not for profit colleges. What again is that site they can get more information from? They, you? Can, they can learn more if they go to www opportunity denied dot org and I'd, I'd urge them to take a look at it it's it is so one-sided and so obvious and such a power grab by the washington bureaucrats that i think every american who looks at it's going to want to call their congressmen and their senators and ask them to intervene and stop it and there's still time to do that it has not been Absolutely. implemented yet thank you very much newt for coming great, on the live great to be show. with you take care you thank too you. have a great day